Yeah, thanks so, thank you so much You're welcome. for introducing us. We would like to talk about algorithms today, but before we do this, um, I will give everybody here on this panel the opportunity to introduce himself. Um, first of all, I would like to introduce myself. I'm part of the Ernst Young Mobility Innovation Group. What we do is we uh, do strategic advisory for cities, governments, and as well the automotive industry. And in order to set the scene today, beside the algorithms, um, I would like to give you some views from our side. And we believe that in nearly 10 or 15 years, the user will buy miles to travel rather than unutilized, unutilized assets. And this is our assumption, and this is the assumption we would see as the fundament for the, today's discussion. What does this mean for the automotive industry? So if they will still be the one who makes the business to the customer, they should do a shift from assets, vehicles, and contracts, to accounts and probably transactions, microtransactions. Why? If they could monetizing car ownership, <coughs> meaning that the people who buy a car could as well earn money with the car, they could probably mitigate sales losses. If they, if they handle with corporate fleets, so have new customers who buy lots of cars, they could uh, do more rental, more leasing, more sharing business in the case that is off balance for the OEM. And finally, if they go into multimodal, and we will talk about this, they will find new customers. This is the scene. The intelligence in order to conduct these kind of strategies is from our point, algorithms. This is our view from Ernst & Young. And now I would like to move to Movil, to Mark. First of all, one, two sentences, or probably three, to Movil. And then you said you have a statement. And I, if you have introduced your company, I will just give you the next hint. OK. Thanks, Rainer. Um, so my name is Randolph from Movil. Um, it's an urban mobility company making cities smarter. Actually, I would like to open um, by looking at cities, um, maybe not at Atlantis, which I think is not a, an excellent example, but on how cities are growing and growing, and also the need for individual mobility in those cities by the citizens uh, is growing. And at the same time, the infrastructure in cities is not really scalable very often. So there's a lot of strain on infrastructure. We have a lot of um, noise and uh, air pollution. There's a lack of space. We have congestion, etc. You all know this. So what we do have to do is to make cities smarter. Um, <coughs> what we can see in technology development at the same time is fascinating. We can now, like with the Movil app, book car sharing, bike sharing, taxi, and um, public transport ticketing in one app. So there has been a tremendous development in technology that is already helping us to shape the way um, cities will work in the future. Not only that, we have also seen that the attitudes of the user have changed. We have seen that sharing a car has become the most normal thing in the world. And um, as we see here today, OEMs are now more and more starting to drive this change, to develop this change. And Daimler has been on the forefront with Car2Go already in 2008, introducing Car2Go, which is now the most successful car sharing scheme in the world. This car sharing and sharing idea is now complemented with um, the idea of being connected, being autonomous, being electric. And Daimler is summing this up in one um, acronym. It's called CASE. So with Movil, Daimler aims to to develop an operating system for smart cities for urban mobility, and I'm happy to discuss with you guys how we can make cities smarter in the future. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mark, RightCell <coughs> is doing a kind of um, white label solutions, mm -hmm. and you seem to be quite successful because uh, you have a lot of customers which have uh, quite powerful brands, right? Indeed. So my name is Mark Thomas. I head up ecosystems and marketing for RideCell. We are a white label provider for car sharing and ride sharing and now autonomous uh, ride hailing. And you know, our thesis is that the companies that will be embracing new mobility 
are those whom stand to lose if private vehicle ownership takes a, a nosedive. So we've been working with companies like BMW, uh, powering their ReachNow service, and uh, certainly OEMs are at the forefront of embracing new mobility. Just the other day, when Ford came up to give their speech, uh, the executive rides up on a bicycle, embracing that's like, we're not an auto company anymore, we are a mobility company. But it's more than just auto companies that are going to be competing in this race to provide the new mobility service. Because when the intersection of autonomous mobility and on-demand ride hailing come together, it's going to change a lot of people's businesses. For instance, auto clubs. What are those but really organized uh, groups for memberships so that you can have a tow package or safety? That's going to be bundled in with new mobility. And so RideSail powers the California's auto club because they realize that their audience was getting older by one year every year, and they needed to have something relevant for millennials. So they created a one-way free-floating car sharing service that we power. Also, car dealerships. They're looking at this new world without private vehicle ownership and wondering, are they going to become the corner video store? You don't need to buy a vehicle if you can press a button and get one on demand. And whom they normally look to for guidance, the OEM, they realize these companies are out to create their own services that are going to be disintermediating them from their customers. So the auto dealerships themselves now realize we've got to get in this business or we could end up becoming part of the new mobility roadkill. There's certainly others, auto insurance companies, rental car companies, lots of these different groups uh, need to embrace mobility and understand how they can, can become part of this ecosystem because the world is definitely changing. Thank you, James. You started as a startup, of course. Yep. And in the meantime, you're linked to a, a big automotive company. Indeed. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. My name is James Cowan. So I'm a director in the global corporate development team at Get. Um, been there for three years and seen a huge amount of movements and change, as you can probably imagine. And for those that don't know, Get. So we're a ground transportation company that na has nationwide presence in the UK, Russia, Israel, and also in New York City. We recently acquired a company called Juno out there in New York City, which has consolidated our presence out there, and we're very much on track to be the number two player in that exciting market. We're also, beyond that, looking to expand across continental Europe and also across the States um, in the forthcoming months. So as you can imagine in our space, there's a huge amount of growth going on, and you know, we're now reaching about 200,000 drivers globally. We complete over 100 million rides on a global basis, and this is growing at an amazing rate. We have both a B2C and also a fully comprehensive B2B solution. So this means everything around scheduled rides, monthly invoicing, business, rule, business rules, client codes, whatever it may be. And so we now have over 7,000 corporations who work with us on a global basis. To date, we've had 640 million in funding. And of course, this time last year, we had a strategic investment by Volkswagen through their Moya um, brand. And Volkswagen is the first partner in what we're building, which is the autonomous vehicle ecosystem. We very much believe that having best-in-class partners in this autonomous vehicle future will stand us in the best position to fulfill and hopefully succeed in that future marketplace that's coming in the next few years. A few of our competitors, on the other hand, view it differently to us, and they feel that they can take the entire value chain when it comes to autonomous vehicles. We believe this will be very challenging, costly, and difficult to succeed at. Because ultimately, when you look at GET, we're excellent when it comes to connecting a driver and a rider together and delivering that person from point A to point B. But when it comes to all the other elements around the autonomous vehicle and making sure that that asset is fully utilized, whether it's the in-ride experience, which we just heard about, insurance, fleet management, building the vehicle, and many more parts, we believe that leveraging on best-in-class partners will put us in the best position going forward. Thank you. Grigor, um, at the first glance, sometimes your business approach seems to be pre-digital. Is, uh, is this right in, in terms of getting people together who would like to leverage the car, kind of ride-sharing on longer distances? 
Uh, that's absolutely true. So uh, I work for Blablacar. Uh, it's the world's largest car pooling platform for long distance journeys. So we bring together drivers and passengers that travel in the same direction on long distance trips so they can share the cost uh, of their journey. And this is very, very important for us. So it's about sharing the cost. It's not about the driver making a profit uh, from the ride. So uh, at the moment, we have over 45 uh, million members. We operate in 22 countries. And uh, per quarter, 20 to, uh, 12 million people uh, travel with Blablaka, mostly between cities or from cities to the urban areas um, of a country. And uh, our position today here is that the ultimate mode of travel will always be a unimodal mode of travel. And why is that? I mean, if you look at what people expect from mobility, it's basically three things. They want convenience and flexibility, A. They want a fair price, B. And more and more, they want to travel in a sustainable manner. And um, for us, uh, when we look at convenience, if a mode of travel can get you from point A to point B directly uh, without having to switch modes, uh, this is basically the embodiment uh, of convenience. You don't have to care about potentially missing a connection, uh, and often it's also the fastest way. So to be clear, this doesn't necessarily have to be the car. Uh, if you live by a metro station or a train station, a train or metro can also be uh, that mode of travel. But we think that for the large majority of, of trips, the car is uniquely positioned to provide this, uh, this convenient unimodal travel uh, experience. And um, this holds especially true if you look at uh, the outskirts of a city and also uh, trips to the countryside, because often there are either no other modes of travel available or it's quite a hassle because you have to wait for a long time or switch modes uh, quite, quite often. Um, so here, the car is basically the way to go. And for us, the beautiful thing is that the shared car not only makes this unimodal mode of travel possible, uh, but it also addresses the other two aspects that I mentioned before, uh, what people uh, expect from mobility. Because if it's truly about sharing, if it's not about making a profit for the driver, uh, you automatically get a fair price uh, for your trip. And when we think about sustainability, Basically, regardless uh, if we think about electric cars or if we think about cars powered by fossil fuels, uh, it's always more efficient to have a full car than just uh, the driver inside. And you can already see uh, the, these developments on Blablacar. People are already using it for these kinds of unimodal trips uh, on long distance. Uh, but uh, obviously, there's still a huge potential um, to change mobility behavior, to convince more and more people uh, to actually share their rights. And uh, maybe keywords that I want to mention uh, in the end is the big ones, but also for sharing is very important. So connectivity um, is one because it will make sharing uh, more instant and much easier. And then if you add to that autonomous driving, um, this will boost, that, uh, boost this uh, much further because then you can actually also share your car even if you don't go uh, yourselves. So uh, for us, it's very clear that uh, the car as a unimodal mode of transport uh, is, in many cases, the future uh, of mobility. Thank you. Randolph, um, you say urban mobility needs to become more smarter and easier to use, which also implies it needs to become more on demand. What, what exactly do you mean with on demand? Is this a um, controversial need to, to um, look at to, to the public transport, or is it probably in line with them? I think I can directly connect to what you just said about the video store. Um, video stores are now gone, more or less, because you book your video on demand. And that, the same thing applies to mobility. You want to use mobility instantly at the very moment you are in a city, for instance. And ideally, a multimodal app gives you, gives you an access to a multitude of options where, from the very moment, you can see I can take a taxi, I can take public transport, I can take car sharing, what will be the duration of the trip, what will be the cost of the trip, and the user can individually decide which mode of transport he wants to use. So this use of mobility is really becoming on demand, and obviously the services connected in this mobility platform are also becoming more on demand. If, if you compare this to the... Um to the idea of having my own car, which I could use whenever I, I would like. 
This is as well on demand, right? Yeah, I think the key, the key word here is giving access, giving the user access to a vehicle, to a mode of transport, to, uh, to something he can use for his transportation. And the thought of the ownership of owning the own car obviously is moving further away, especially when you look at, at large cities, yeah, where many people often don't, well, more and more people don't own a car anymore because of lack of parking mm -hmm. space and so forth. I mean, the, the definition of freedom is changing. I mean, people think that freedom is owning the car, you can get in it and just go. But then you realize there's a tyranny associated with this. When you arrive, you have to park. And as cities make more and more, you know, fewer and fewer spots available for parking, is it really freedom to have to wash your car, get it smogged, you know, have the oil changed? Uh, there's a lot of things that we uh, just assume are involved in transportation that's, that we have for this freedom. The real freedom is being able to push a button get from one place to another and have the overall cost be less than half of what it would cost if you used your own car. And that's the real revolution that's going to take place when the autonomous driving intersects with this on-demand mobility and the cost of the driver is removed. You can get the, the cost of using a, a ride-hailing service far below the cost of vehicle ownership. And that's the tipping point when uh, people start getting rid of their cars and understanding that's the way to go. Right. When, uh, I mean, freedom to change is what, what you just mentioned. Um, Gregor, you, your statement is the ultimate solution for transfer is always a unimodal solution. So how does this fit in the freedom to change? Yeah, I, I think so. It always depends uh, if you look at the city or on long distance and rural areas, I would say. What you just said, we basically agree. So in the city, it often doesn't make sense to, to own a car. Uh, and free-floating car-sharing systems are often a very good way, uh, or the public transport system. But people not only travel within a city, right? And what people often overlook is the emotional component uh, to a car. Uh, often you selected it yourself. I mean, people don't just buy, I don't know, uh, a BMW because of the technical features, but also because of an uh, emotional connection. And that's also connected to the interior of the car. You have a baby seat within, you have your tennis racket within. Um, so there's this aspect um, that we shouldn't forget. Uh, and for this reason, we think that people will still want to own cars for certain um, travel needs uh, that they have. And then coming back to the unimodal versus uh, intermodal uh, aspect, um, for now, I think that makes sense, but uh, if we look a little bit further in the future, maybe you have free-floating autonom uh, autonomous uh, vehicle networks, uh, then the question is, do you still need this intermodal travel even in the city, or will you be able to basically just catch uh, an autonomous vehicle and then go uh, unimodally uh, from point A to point B? Um, I introduced the session with, with uh, uh, discussing or probably uh, saying that private vehicle sales will drop, so let us let us assume. I don't know if everybody of us will uh, will agree to this, but let, let us assume for a while. So, M Mark said um, the companies that will create autonomous ride hailing services are those who stand to lose when private vehicle sales drops. Could you elaborate a little bit on that? S certainly. Um, so, as we talked about at the beginning, there will won't be as much of a drop in vehicle sales overall, but the buyer of the vehicles will change dramatically. In urban areas uh, in North America between 2025 and 2030 will be the tipping point where more than half of the vehicles sold will be sold to mobility service providers and not private individuals. So if you look overall at the vehicle sales, there's not this you know, huge drop off, but the customer mix will. And when, when you sell into a mobility service, those are the companies that completely vertically integrate. They will probably have one insurance relationship. They will have their own shops that do the maintenance. They will have their own places that do the car washes. So all of these ancillary businesses that depend upon private vehicle ownership uh, to, you know, there's a collision with autonomous. Certainly we think the number of collisions will go down. So these businesses, who depend upon this ecosystem are going to need to join forces with the autonomous providers. You could see even with Waymo, Avis has decided to become their, their car wash partner because they have a 
great distribution. So we're, we will see a consolidation in the industry uh, as the, the, the buying power of these much fewer customers for mobility service providers really take over and start to give customers the choice uh, of do you want to go with the green car sharing service or the, the luxury car sharing service. So, you know, in the same way that the airline industry has a number of different mobility services today, you know, you can take Ryanair or Emirates and they, they will both get you there, but it's a very different experience. So we don't believe that there's going to be a, you know, just one mobility service provider in the industry. We think that there'll be a maturity and there'll be a lot of different providers that each offer a value proposition of its own. And just, just to touch upon that, I think, you know, it's, it's really important to point out, as you rightly mentioned, the sort of Ryanair versus Emirates way of looking at things. I think we see going forward that the in-ride experience is going to be so crucial. The airlines are a key example. You get it today, you've got business class, first class. People pay you know, significant multiples on what they would in economy class. And we feel going forward when it comes to in-ride experience of ground transportation, that's going to be the key element that people are going to pay that little bit more because they're going to have virtual reality. They're going to be able to have meeting rooms in there. They're going to be able to have directional music, whatever it may be. And I think that's vitally important going forward. Yeah, yeah I mean, um, you said the winner of uh, autonomous vehicle will be an ecosystem partnership rather than an individual entity. So there will not the idea of having three, four, five companies who will more or less rule all the transportation issues, but you say there's like probably airline alliances, some kinds of, of, uh, of these ecosystems? Yeah, we, we are of the opinion that in each city or region there'll be sort of two to three players. And we think the way that most companies will approach this is from an ecosystem standpoint. You know, you have ourselves and, you know, we're very good at getting someone from A to B, but can we build a vehicle? No, we can't. Can we, you know, do insurance? It's not our expertise. The same with in-ride experience, the energy infrastructure. There's so many different elements associated with autonomous vehicles that to do it as one company, we feel it's going to be very challenging. And if you look at the capital needs to actually do that and succeed, I think it's going to be extremely difficult. So we feel that if we can build a best-in-class sort of ecosystem of multiple partners across all of those verticals and bring them together as one and then go to cities and say, this is the solution we're going to bring you, do you want to have it? I think that's the way we look at it. And sort of touching upon what you mentioned, we feel that banks are going to be the people that own vehicles rather than individuals. And that's what's going to be that sort of massive switch across from where it is currently today. James, get claims that... Uh your ride-sharing, ride-hitting services, um, will the customer not wait no longer than two to three minutes? So uh, how intelligent is al your algorithm? Or have you so, so much cars? So what is the... It's a good uh, question. I think if you, if you look back at sort of where taxis were 10 years ago, wherever you may be, London, Berlin, Munich, Frankfurt, you had companies that had access to a few hundred vehicles. So wherever you were in the center of the city or perhaps in the suburbs, you may have been lucky and you may have been able to get a car in one minute. But you may also have to wait for sort of 20, 25, perhaps even more. And on average, it worked out about 10 to 15 minutes to get a car to your door. Now, on the other hand, because of the fact that we don't own cars and we work directly with drivers and they can accept jobs or they cannot accept jobs, we have you know, huge fleets of vehicles. You know, for example, in London, we have 15,000 black cabs that work with us. So pretty much wherever you are in the city, we can get there within one, two, sometimes three, three and a half minutes. And that's why we can provide this excellent service to both consumers and also to corporates. And I think, you know, again, touching upon what we mentioned earlier around the on-demand elements, before, if you had to wait half an hour for a car, it's, it's not on demand. It's much easier to go to the parking lot and to get your own car. But now, when you can get a car right to your door, outside your work, outside the restaurant, wherever it may be, that's, that's what changes the dynamics of where we are. Thanks. Randolph, um, Moodle said you will identify the optimal route from A to B. So this is more or less your value added to, to the customer. Uh, optimal in a, very, in a very individual way, meaning that everybody will have his own def definition of what the optimal route will be. Of course, very often it will be the shortest, the quickest, but it might also be the cheapest um, or the most comfortable. So I think the art is really to 
give the choice to the user, mm. let the user decide what would be his preference in, in taking a route. Coming back to right cell, so uh, when we talk about your value proposition, you are talking about machine learning, predictive fleet management, but machine learning is probably most of the interesting thing. So what are you doing? What are your miracle? Certainly. Uh, one of the things about operating a uh, car sharing service, you know, these have been around for quite some time, and they've, they've not been wildly profitable to date. There's uh, typically around 15% utilization for the vehicles, uh, which puts it in the, the black territory, but not, not tremendously. With RideCell, we've, you know, based out of Silicon Valley, we're using machine learning to allow our customers to predictively figure out where the car should be so that when the customer's looking for a car, there's one just a block away instead of eight blocks away. And if it's eight blocks away, they may choose to take an Uber or a Lyft and not, not drive themselves. And then being able to use machine learning to do fleet conditioning, to offer things like discounts on cars that are at the edge of the network, so that it's like, you know, this car is probably going to sit here for 48 hours before somebody rents it. But if you've got some intelligence that says, hey, rather than pay someone to move it, which costs you money, why don't you just offer the customer that car if they bring it back to downtown at 50% off. So being able to use intelligence lets it be a win-win situation. Customers can save money. They can be incentivized to re rearrange the fleet. Uh, and really, uh, one of the benefits of having a customer um, use our platform is that they can then have information shared across lots of different other platforms. If the information is just their own, they've done an in-house version, that data is a silo. So you get a benefit of by contributing your information, you also get the information from others, uh, which really helps. And that's, that's how the big data revolution needs to work. Um, one last question to, to the issue of um, algorithm. James, you acquired the Israeli company Street Smart. So what was the rationale behind that? So I think you know, key to who we are, we, we very much believe in having a driver-centric offering, so providing an excellent service to drivers and making sure that we can improve their utilization, obviously to give them great jobs in both the B2C and B2B angle. And Street Smart was an acquisition we did a couple of months ago, which allows drivers to be more efficient when it comes to actually getting from point A to point B what is the most efficient route for their day. So it all leads into this sort of perpetual ride theory that we're building, which is ultimately we want a driver to wake up in the morning to know that these are going to be their routes for the day. These are the, going to be the passengers that they pick up and drop off. This is where they're going to have lunch. This is where they're going to have a coffee break and get to this position where ultimately they just drive and they just pick up people, they drop people off and move on. And Street Smart's very much part of, of that behavior. OK, thank you. Gregory. Uh you work in France together with ALD Automotive and Opel, right? In order to, you work together in France with ALD yes. Automotive and, and Opel in order to offer kind of car as a service. Exactly. Could you give us some insights there? Yes. Yeah, so in, in France, we have entered a partnership with the uh, with a leasing giant AL, ALD to offer to our ambassadors, so to the most active drivers on the platform, a very lucrative uh, leasing deal. So the, the yearly costs of leasing a car through BlaBlaCar and ALD uh, is about 10% lower than owning a car yourself. Uh, and in the future, you could potentially actually finance your car, so decrease your, your leasing rates uh, by sharing your car. Uh, so we will directly uh, funnel that money into, into your leasing uh, contract. So this is one of the approaches you could have to, to leverage your community and to bring additional value uh, to them. Um, and to build an ecosystem around the, the sharing community that we already have. Okay. Randolph, I remember Movil two, three years ago, and you were more or less targeting the end customer. And now, if I understand right, you try to work or you work together with larger cities. Yeah, I think um, why not give this fantastic uh, opportunity of this multimodal technology platform also directly to cities, exactly in a sense of having an operating system for this city which is multimodal, and why not make it under the brand of the city or of the public transport operator, like we did in Karlsruhe with uh, the KVV app, 
I think it's a very uh, good thing to also encourage more and more usage of, this new, of these new services. Okay. Thank you so much. 30 minutes, uh, insights to car sharing, ride hailing, and so on. Thank you for listening to us. Goodbye.